Riverbend Church, good morning. Y'all doing all right? We already scored early here in the first quarter, you know what I mean? That's been good this morning. Welcome to Riverbend. Uh, if you're new here today, my name is Joe. I'm the pastor. We're kicking off a series called Fed Up. What an appropriate series to describe the past few months, right? Past few months, it seems that, you know, I can't help believe a lot of us have felt this emotion at some point of fed up. Now, maybe you're there today and you're like, man, you're reading my text message this morning. I am fed up. But at some point over the last several months, I think all of us come to the place, though, where there's just this emotion of I'm fed up with something. And you know what fuels that in, in part are questions that don't have answers. And here's what I mean. Some of us are fed up because you're going, when will the uncertainty end? Anybody there with me? Like, when is the uncertainty going to end? Or will or a really important one, will we have any college football, right? Come on now, that's important. It's like, I'm fed up. I don't know what's going to happen. Everybody's backing out. Are we going to play or not, you know? Are we going to get to play any football this fall? It's a question. You know, one of the fed up uh, questions is like, what is the right path for my kids for school this year? It seems like it's ever-changing, and there's no constants, and there's constant uncertainty with that. Like, what's the right path? Or what's going to happen to our economy? Or when will I be able to hug freely again, you know, without being concerned? Or, or will I be able to support my family? Or what about the coming election? So all these questions that, honestly, there's really no good answer to. We like answers. We like certainty. And so when we don't have it, sometimes it gets us fed up. But as I thought about this for myself, though, do you know that also uh, it's not just unanswerable questions that leave us fed up? You know what else leaves us fed up? Actual situations and circumstances we're dealing with that we can do nothing about. For instance, there are real fears and anxieties that go with COVID-19. It's not a hoax. There are real fears as we watch you know, our world around us and our nation and our state and our county. And also uh, right now, they're, they're, some of the things that have us fed up are uh, and you got to choose which camp you're in here, but some of us say everyone is just overreacting and I'm fed up with it. And then you put yourself on the other side, everyone is underreacting and I'm just fed up with it, right? It tends to be divisive. Should you wear a mask? Shouldn't you? It seems to be wisest that we would, you know, uh, put a mask on to protect when we're going to know we're going to be in closed situations. And so there's a lot of different data and a lot of things and we're going, uh, well, it, you know, this has just got me frustrated. I'm fed up with it whatever camp you fall in. And so another question is like, you know, right now uh, there, there's been a racial tension and it's not a new racial tension. It's something that's been brought to the forefront. And, and I'll be honest, for many of us, we're fed up when we see some of the stories and then with how people handle themselves, depending on, you know, whether it's actually truth or whether it's somebody taking a, a terrible situation and writing their own agenda to go with it. And that's happened. But here's the, here's the truth though. Um, we, we are kind of fed up as a church with some things we're seeing in our world, aren't we? And we're going, God, you, we know better than that. We know you, you, that you love us all. Listen, it's not limited to skin color, even though it seems to be parts of our world in the church, it's not. Jesus set us free from that. It doesn't matter. He loves us all. He shows no favoritism, and so it's crazy. But uh, the other thing is, you know, uh, when, when we think about one of the things being brought to light that leaves us fed up is, is like needs in our community. You see people who are hurting. You see kids who don't have needs met. I mean, doesn't that leave us fed up a little bit? Going, man. So here's what I want to say, church. If we're honest with ourselves, I can't blame you, and I hope you won't blame me for feeling this emotion too much sometimes, just being fed up, just going, this is ridiculous. Fed up with it. I don't think we can blame each other. And I think what happens is, though, we get to the point where we go, I can't take this anymore. I have to do something about it. Whether it's stop caring or whether it's speak up on social media, whether it's take a stand to make a difference, we're just like, I'm fed up. I have to do something about this. Now, before we dive into this conversation that's going to take the next two or three weeks, we're going to take a deep look into God's Word and some stories to give us some help here. I want to step in as your pastor if you'll allow me to. Now, you may be new and you're going, I don't know you. That, that's okay. I want to ask you just for a few minutes, will you allow me to speak this into your life? See, being fed up can lead you down one of two paths. Sometimes it leads us down the path of doing something really stupid, and actually there's another path that can lead us to freedom and real change. But you can't do both at the same time. See, here's the thing. Sometimes we make decisions when we're fed up, and I can just speak personally for me. Sometimes you can burn relationship bridges when you're fed up that you regret for the rest of your life. 
You know what I mean? I mean, we get there. Some, sometimes, you know, it, it, sometimes we pull triggers we can't unpull. Sometimes we post things that people can't unsee. Sometimes we make fools of ourselves and do more harm than good. And so here's what I want to get at during this series. Fed up is a normal emotion. It's not a sin. It's not wrong to get to, your, to the place in your life where you're going, all right, Joe, I am fed up. I got to tell somebody about this. Like, I just need you to know my heart. I'm fed up with, and then you fill in the blank. There's nothing wrong with that. But here's what I want to come as your pastor and say, we have to consider what our next step is when we get fed up, though. See, you know the difference in somebody that gets fed up and does something they regret forever and somebody that gets fed up and then they make a difference? It's the next step they choose to take every time. It's a conscious, as followers of Jesus, a conscious next step that we actually do something with being uh, feeling fed up. Now, before we dive in, I want to give you a definition of fed up. And here it is, if you're taking notes. Fed up, and this is not a dictionary definition, this is my definition, all right? So Joe's Dictionary, here it goes, for this series. When the pain of doing nothing outgrows the pain of doing something. That's what I mean when I say fed up. I am so fed up. I've, I've been able to do nothing for a long time, but now at this point... The pain of me doing nothing is actually greater now than me doing something. And I, I tell you a story about me. I thought about this week. I was, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I had been on the low maintenance dental plan. And by low maintenance dental plan, I mean brush your teeth. You know what I mean? Floss, brush, try to take care of them. And, and so I had a tooth that started hurting really bad in the back. I mean, it was killing me. And so I'm like, most, I don't know, like most guys, I'm like, I ought to be fine. Just chew on the other side. You know, that's what you do. You know, you're hurting really bad. And so do you go to the dentist? No, you go chew on the other side. So you teach yourself to compensate. You know what I mean? I start chewing on the left side and I'm like, oh, it's fine. So I go probably rock on another year or so. And I'm like, it's fine. I don't even think it hurts anymore. And then sometimes you get tears in your eyes. Think of, people think you're emotional. And it's like, nope, I actually just got something cold on that side. Like I done got to hurting that much. And I'm like, all right, I'm stubborn. And Courtney's like, you need to go get this fixed. And so I finally make the point. You know what happened to me? I got so fed up. The pain of doing nothing outgrew the pain of doing something. I was like, I don't care how bad it hurts. I've got to have this fixed now. See, I actually think that that's what fed up's meant to do to us. We get to the point where some of you are like me. Some of you are real kind and peaceful and calm. Others of you are just stubborn. Like me, you're stubborn and, and God's going, come on, I want to make a change in your life. And when you get fed up, he brings you to the point of fed up for a reason. And here's the spiritual truth, I think, behind being fed up, that God wants us to be freed up. You cannot make a difference in this world, no matter how much injustice you see, until you as a person are freed up in Christ. When you get freed up in Christ, you are unstoppable for the kingdom's sake. But until you do, listen, we do things we regret, even when we're trying to do good sometimes. We do a lot we regret when we haven't gotten first freed up. Now, here's what I also want to let you know that I'm aware of. Fed up is not just pandemic related. Fed up is something that we turn inwardly on ourselves often. And here's what I mean. For some of us, we're fed up with failing relationships. Or it's like, if you only knew what was going on in the relationship right now, I'm so fed up with it. We've been going through this forever, this pain. I'm so ready for change and I'm here. But here's the thing, like I'm just, I'm fed up with it. Or maybe your own flaws and failures. And here's what I mean, that internal anxiety that people just say, why are you so worried? Why are you worried about it? Why are you so concerned? Why are you letting this anxiety rule your life? Why are you having panic attacks? It doesn't make any sense. And for you, you're going, I'm fed up with it, but it's like, I don't know the next step to freedom. You know what else can happen, especially during this time, like addiction that used to hold you captive and maybe even Jesus set you free. But during a time of isolation, just a weird time, it pulls people back in. And so right now during this time, you turn it on yourselves and you go, I'm fed up with this addiction, but I don't know how to take a next step to freedom. Like I've tried, I've already did it once and then I fell back and people will, I'll be embarrassed if I have to go forward again and say I'm struggling. Also, another thing that we get fed up with is our secret lives. As believers, you could, you could say like our secret sins, the things that, the cords that hold us fast behind the scenes that we don't want to say out loud. And, and yet internally we're fed up with it and we're trying to deal with it inside. And eventually it's going to come out unless we take next steps to deal with it. Here's the thing. When we get fed up, do you know what we tend to do? We tend to cover up. We don't end up in freedom. 
We end up covering up and covering up and trying to mask it and make everything look great. And here's the thing. If we felt isolated before this quarantine, all of this is wrestling in our spirits right now. Not only what we see around us, but what you know is going on inside you that I don't know. So you can put a smile on your face this morning and go, good morning, pastor. Everything's great. And inside you're going, if you only knew. If you only knew all of what I'm feeling inside. Now, here's what I want you to know. The gospel truth of Jesus speaks to this emotion. And I'm going to tell you where we're going before we even get there today. Here's what Jesus said to his followers, John 8, 32. Look at this. He says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so here's, the, here's, a, here's one of the first steps we have to be willing to take. God, I'm fed up. But before I do anything else, I want to know what your word, what your truth has to say. I want to know what your truth has to say about our culture right now because it's crazy. It's hard to determine about our political uh, kind of mess that's going on. You know, whatever. Here's the thing. Jesus is bigger than all that. We have to seek him first to let him lead us as this church to know what we should do and how should we, we should react, how we should vote, how we should take a stand. But we got to seek his truth first. See, here's what he says. When you come to me and you let me be honest with you about who you are, then you can be free. When you come to me and you let me be honest, let my truth speak to what you're dealing with in our culture, then you can be set free. So it's coming to that reality. Now, here's what we're going to do over the next few weeks. We're going to look at God's word and look at the life of Jesus and see how he can take people from fed up to freed up so that we can make a difference. Fed up to freed up. Now, the story I'm going to tell you this morning, I've given this guy a nickname, Too Late Tim, all right? I don't know if anybody named Tim here, no offense to you, but here's the thing, Too Late Tim, and I'll show you why I call him that, but here's, a, here, here's the setup of the story before we get here. Jesus is heading back into Jerusalem, and he just had a, a, a famous conversation with a woman at the well, as we know it, a Samaritan woman at a well. He just told her about living water that she can have, so he's walking back to town after this interaction, and here's what happens. Uh, he runs into this guy, and I've called him Too Late Tim, just so I can remember it, all right? So here's what it says, verse 1. It says that afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for the one day of, for one of the Jewish holy days. Uh, we believe this was probably Passover. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Interesting fact about these five covered porches, uh, not too, a few years back, they were excavating a site where they thought this pool of Bethesda may have been near the Sheep Gate, uh, which they know its location, and they found this place where it's five covered porches, uh, five covered like stone marble type porches that are built there. And so historically, you can align this and go find where this place was exactly. But here's what happened. Three, verse three, it says, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches, waiting for a certain movement of the water. For an angel of the Lord came from the water, uh, to the water from time to time and stirred it. And here's the thing. It says, and the first person to step in, the first person to step into the water uh, after it was stirred was healed of whatever disease he had. And so here's what I want to tell you about this verse 3 and 4. Depending on what Bible translation you have, this may or may not be included in the text. It may be in the footnotes, and here's why. Most scholars say that it was not uh, found in a manuscript, original manuscript, until later, uh, like second century. In earliest manuscripts, they didn't find this section. And so they went around and they said, well, is it really an angel of the Lord would come down and bubble this water up and then people that would get in and they were healed? That seems weird. Now, here's my take on it. It would not be, but it would be one of the many unusual ways Jesus healed if he decided to let this water be bubbled up by an angel and then somebody got in. You know what's most likely, though, maybe a legend, that somebody was healed one day, and so they were thinking, well, when the water bubbles, it's an angel. So either way, was it really God's healing? We don't know. We don't have another story about this pool. Uh, or was it just this legend? If you lay by this pool, when you see the water bubble, you roll in, you get healed. So we don't know uh, which way it was, but here's the thing. Either way, here's the guy, Timmy, that you're going to meet, verse 5. Here's what it says. One of the men, and that's his Tim right here, lying there had been sick for 38 years. It's a long time to be sick, right? 38 years. Now, here's what we'll find out about him. He's obviously older than this because he had not been paralyzed his entire life. We find out he's paralyzed and can't move. Now, here's what it says in verse 6, an astounding question Jesus is about to ask. It says, when Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Now, check that question out. 
guy on a mat by a pool, 38 years, never been able to get into the water. And Jesus has the nerve to look at him and say, would you like to get well? I read this and I go, Jesus, what were you thinking? I mean, don't you know, of course, the obvious answer is yes. But then I started thinking about my own life. I understand that Jesus claims in his word to give me new life. He can give me new life. But do I always want to let go of my old life or not? You know, one of the things I, I've wrestled with is I think at times we become so used to our disability that we're not sure we want to let go of it. We become so used to our addiction that it's just part of who we are. And we go, I, I don't know. It's not that I don't believe Jesus can. I'm just not sure even if I can, that I want to let go. It's just kind of who I am. And when Jesus asked this question, one of the reasons I think he asked it was to see whether the guy was really to a point where he wanted to be healed. What are some other answers the guy could have given him? Jesus said, would you like to get well? He could have said, no, Jesus, just drop a hundred in my cup and move on. You know, my guitar case here, move on. There's all these sick people laying around. It was known that side of town people would come who were generous and, and maybe give money, uh, sort of taking care of those that couldn't take care of themselves. And so uh, he could have said, Jesus, can you just give me a hundred bucks? Or he could have said, modern day, Jesus, will you just share my GoFundMe on your page? Can you just help me out a little bit? I mean, Jesus, can you just give me some pain meds? You know, my back's really hurting. Like my, I can't move my legs, my back. Can you just, I just think about things like that. But here's the thing. Before we get too righteous thinking about Jesus' question, we have to consider this. Do we surrender our lives to him and yet let old things have a hold on us that we don't want to let go of? That's a question the church has to wrestle with. Why don't more of us look like Jesus? I don't think it's because we don't want to. I think sometimes we're just too afraid to let go of whatever vice has held us captive for all these years of whatever it is. If I get free, I won't even know who I am anymore. Yes, you will. You'll be in Jesus Christ. He has the best version of you in mind. But here's the thing. Do we want to let go of our secret lives? Do we want to let go of our crutches and, and our lifestyles that need to change when we come to Jesus? And so the question of Jesus applies to his church today to look at you and say that when I went to the cross, I paid the price for every wrong thing you would ever do. Not only that, I, in, I, I restored the relationship. By faith in me, you can have a restored relationship with the Father, but not only there, it doesn't stop there. Also, you can step into new life today and eternal life forever. That's the gospel. You get to step into new life now, but here's the question to the church. Do you want to be well? It really presses into who we are, doesn't it? Like, you know that deep pain that you have, that thing that you're going, I don't know if I want, I know God's convicted me about letting go of that and dealing with that. But I don't know if I want to let go of it or not. You know what? You know what Jesus was really getting at here? When I look at it, I see Jesus looking at this guy. Too late, Timmy. He's looking at him. He goes, hey, you really want to get well. You know what he's saying? Are you so fed up with being paralyzed and whatever all happened to you and all the emotional pain that went with? Are you so fed up with that that you're really ready to get free? Do you want me to heal you? Do you believe I can heal you? So here's the first step. I'm going to give you a pathway to freedom. And here it is. It always begins, I think, with fed up. What do you mean? When people want to get free, listen, you don't change until the point where the pain of staying the same gets greater than the pain of change. That's where we are. When our lives start hurting, when God lets things press in on us and we get fed up and we go, all right, what do I do? Now, here's Jesus' question. Would you like to get well? Now, look at Tim's answer here, verse 7. Here's what he says. I can't. Say, I can't. That is very natural in our vocabulary, isn't it? I can't. But here's the thing. He wasn't saying like, I can't, I don't want to. Usually when we say I can't, a lot of times it's, well, I don't really want to. But what he was saying is 38 years I've been trying. I can't, sir. And look at, his, look at what he, his, his reasoning. He says, I have no one. I can't and I have no one. Didn't that sound like a lot of our reasons today? I can't and I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. That's where I get too late, Tim, by the way. Someone else always beats me to it. I'm always second place or last place. I'm always too late. I'm never first place. I'm always a little bit too late. Anybody here just feel like you're always just a little bit too late to the party? Just a little bit too late getting there? That's this guy. But here's the thing. 
Tim desperately desires to be healed, and we see it in his answer here, I can't, sir. So here's the, here's the next step on that pathway to freedom, and it's this, is to fess up. And let me show you what I mean. When he said, I can't, sir, what he was doing is not making an excuse to Jesus. He was telling the truth to Jesus. He was owning it. I've tried to roll, maybe, and this is holy imagination, I've tried to roll into the pool. You know, I've tried to get on a hill where I could roll down into the pool. I've tried to sit on the edge waiting for the water to bubble. I've tried everything, Jesus. My friend Sam said he was going to come over and help me. My friend Lenny was going to come and bury, and none of them showed up to help me. And so here I am. I have no one, and I can't. What he was getting at is, Jesus, let me tell you the honest truth. I can't do this on my own. Let me tell you why this is good news for us. Listen, when you get fed up with something about yourself or something that's happening, the next step should be to fess up. I can't just own it to God, own whatever you're dealing with to God. And here's the good news about that. John wrote this down that Jesus said in John chapter five, Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter five. Here's what it says. I have come not to call those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. So here we have Tim and he's going, Jesus, I can't do this on my own. I've tried. You know what Jesus was getting at here? I didn't come for those who were unwilling to admit that they need help. I came for those who would actually confess. That's what this says. I didn't come for those who act like they got their whole life together all the time and don't need any help. I came for those who have messed up, who've made choices that have hurt them and others who have internal battles going on, who do wrestle with the anxiety. I came though for those that would be willing to say, Jesus, I confess it. I will say it and I will own it. And here's what we're going to see next. We're going to see that, that Tim here is given a command. And before I say this, it's kind of crazy because Jesus asked him if he wants to be made well. Tim says, I can't. And what he's getting at is, I confess, Jesus, I can. I'm on my own. I want to, but I'm always too late. I'm always too late without you. And so look at verse 8. Jesus told him this. Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping bag and began walking. Now, here's a crazy thing. Hiding in this word stand right here is something that you don't see unless you've read it as many times as I have. And you're going, God, usually Jesus would do something like, spit in the mud and rub it on the eyes and that would bring healing. Or he, you know, in the Old Testament of the Bible, one time the prophet told, uh, told Naaman, he said, go dip yourself in the river seven times and you'll be healed. Like there's all these unusual ways that Jesus healed, but this time we don't see him do anything. He just simply looked at the guy and said, stand up. And so when you, when you see this, what you don't see is you don't see him first healing Usually Jesus made something like stretch out your hand. And so he stretched it out and all of a sudden it was healed. And so for this guy, it's kind of the same thing. He says, hey dude, 38 years on that mat, can't get up. Stand up, pick up your mat and walk. See, here's the thing. In this word stand right here, we find something hiding called faith. And here's what I mean. Think about it. This dude has been on the mat for 38 years at other people's mercy. And now Jesus looks at him and says, stand up. You know what he could have said? <laughs> I can't do that either, Jesus. But in his heart, in that very moment, he believed that, okay, this guy, maybe he really is who I've heard about. There's something to this cat. And he starts leaning forward and putting weight on his ankles for the first time in 38 years. That's exactly what our Christian walk has to be like. For many of us, we've been told to stand up and walk. We just hadn't had the faith to lean forward and put weight on our feet. Lean forward. It's a mental decision to go, God, yes, I can. It's that mental decision of faith to lean forward and get up. See, here's the deal. If you want to really move towards freedom, you got to get to this place where you faith up. And that's my word. That's not even a word, but faith up. Here's what that means. You got to get fed up and then fess up. And when you faith up, what that means is you start applying your faith to what God has already said about you. Jesus had already told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Listen, this is for somebody that's been saved by Jesus, and now you're fed up with the old way always getting a grip on you again, maybe you just need to start putting weight on the ankles. Maybe you need to lean forward and start trying to stand. God has said you have new life. Maybe you need to lean into it. Now, here's what I will say about new life. 
And the reason I say this is you've heard those stories where somebody, you know, maybe they had an addiction or they had something and you would go, man, that person's far from God, whatever your definition of that is. And then they come to Jesus and overnight everything changes. All of a sudden, praise the Lord for those testimonies, all right? I thank you, Jesus, that there are some people like that. For the majority of us, though, guess what? We give our lives to Jesus, we wake up the next morning, and it's still the same battles that we're facing. We have a new fighter with us, we have new life inside us, but we're fighting a lot of the same battles again. And here's the thing, we have to put faith where we said we believed the day before. we got to put Monday faith on our Sunday words. And so here it is. Sometimes when you actually have faith and you start to lean forward, as, as Tim did, and put weight on the ankles, it may lead you to rehab. Let me say that again. Just because you have faith in Jesus doesn't mean you don't need the help of brothers and sisters around you. You go, Joe, I know that he says I have new life and I can get freed from this addiction. Well, here's the thing. You actually got to lean forward and put weight on the ankles. And what that means is it may mean getting to somebody who loves you and helping to get to somewhere where you can get help. It also may lead you to counseling. You go, I don't believe in those things. Well, listen, as a follower of Jesus, it may lead you to counseling. If you really want help, pouring out your heart or pastoral guidance or prayer or habit change. But here's what faith up means. It means you can do everything that God says you can do. You can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives you strength. Now, the rest of the story, I want to show you those who think they are righteous, those that Jesus said, I didn't come for you. You think you got it all together already. I came for those who are willing to admit that they have issues and that their life is messy. But we find those, the Pharisees, plotting against Jesus. Now, look at verse 9. As the man stood up, here's what it said. Instantly, he was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But the miracle happened on the Sabbath. And so Jewish leaders, the preachers of their day, the church leaders, they said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. Hang on. Now we saw somebody get healed. He's been laying there 38 years, stand up and walk. And here's what they're worried about. Listen, dude, you can't roll up a mat on the Sabbath day. Our rules say that there's no way that you should be able to do that. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. Was it that the law didn't allow it? They didn't allow it. They took their own traditions and tried to, to, to tell a man who had been healed, you can't, you can't do that. So the man obeys by faith and he gets up. And now he's got haters. Can I pause there for a moment? When you get up in Jesus' name, when you stand up in faith, you will have haters. Somebody will look at you and they'll decide that they don't like the new you because it doesn't please them, and you're going to have haters. There's going to be somebody that goes, I just don't get you anymore. You think different, you act different, you talk different than you used to. Why are you making these crazy radical changes in your life? And they're going to judge you, and they're going to be haters. That's just what they're going to be. Listen, even the religious people of the day. Now, church, we have decided at Riverbend Church that we will not be a place that is full of haters, that we're going to look at people with open arms and go, you got issues, we got issues, Jesus has answers. That's it. That's who we are as a church family. But here's the thing, your healing may tick someone else off. Your friends won't get you anymore. Suppliers who lost their income won't like you anymore. Uh, the side of relationships, uh, the, the side relationships that when God calls you to faithfulness, listen to your husband or wife, they won't get you anymore. And so they come up with this technicality and they miss the miracle. Do you know something else I love about this? Whenever he picked up the mat and he walked, he started carrying the thing that had carried him for 38 years. Let me tell you the significance of that. Jesus could have said, stand up and leave. But he specifically said, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. As he walked through town, do you know what he carried with him? His testimony. It was the mat. He walked through town, carried it. Do you know it's the same way? This is what we say here, that Jesus turned sin scars into forgiveness stories. He doesn't always take away the scars this world leaves on us. I mean, we wish he would sometimes just take it all away. God, I don't want people to see that nasty section of my life where I was wounded. But many times what he does is he comes and he, he brings healing and restoration to the wound, but the scar stays. And then our scars on our life from the failed relationships, from the bad choices, what they become is that mat we're carrying through town because people see it and they go, you used to lay on that, but now you carry that. That used to carry you through life. Now you have that to tell your story with. See, can I tell you this? Don't be ashamed of what God's brought you through. That very story, that mat that's in your life, that scar, that may be the thing that opens someone else's eyes to the fact that there is a God that loves them. 
And they may see if he did that for you, then maybe he can do that for me. Maybe he can tell me to get up and walk. Now let's look at what happens here. Verse 11, he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing? The Pharisees demanded. The man didn't know that because Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. So he wasn't hundred percent sure it was Jesus that healed him. Verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. So this time Jesus goes to him and check this out. Tells us a lot about the story. Now you're well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. So we learned a couple of things about Tim in the story here. Oh, too late, Tim here. There was a spiritual transaction that was taking place here. See what Jesus said, now go away and sin no more. One of the things we didn't see as he stood up was there was some faith that he was putting in the Son of God. He didn't even know for sure that it was the Son of God. I love that about the story. We come to Jesus unsure sometimes, and if we're not careful, we can shun people away and go, well, if you're not 100% sure, then, then you're 100% lost. And I'm going, come on, man. Are we ever 100% sure of anything? I think there's a satisfaction. There's an experience of our faith. But I think there are times where we go, is it even real? Like, where are you, God? If you don't have those times, that just means you're not human. But here's the thing. Came to the point where he had to deal with his own inner stuff that was going on. The soul hold. See, Jesus didn't just give him his feet back again. You know what he gave him? He gave him his grace back again. He gave him his freedom back again. He gave him soul wholeness. You find that right there. But here's what else you see. Jesus said, go stop sinning or something worse may happen. Do you know what he may have been alluding to? The fact that whatever paralyzed him actually was of his own doing. So let's bring it to modern day. What if it was a DUI? that actually not only paralyzed him, but took the life of someone else. Changes things when you start thinking about this guy, doesn't it? You go, well, now I'm upset with him. He shouldn't have got behind the wheel drunk and, and took someone else's life, right? But now you got a guy who for 38 years, whatever the reason, whatever the sin, whatever the wrong in his life that caused him to be paralyzed, he had 38 years to lay on a mat and think about the guilt. Do you know what that does? That creates a shadow of shame over your life so large that you can never get out from under it. It's always there. 38 years, he's thinking about it. Whatever that sin was. Listen, we don't know this. This is holy imagination. What if he lost his wife and his kids in this process? What if he lost that that he loved the most? What if he was a young man and he did something that cost his parents? Or then on the flip side, maybe he was a victim. He did have wrong, but he was a victim. Either way, at this point, don't you know for 38 years there was probably some guilt that he carried laying on that mat. And here's what Jesus did. He said, now go and, and sin no more. That's the version of this. Go away and sin no more. You've been given freedom in me. See, here's what it is. Whenever you get to the point where you finally have fessed up and you put your faith up, you start to stand, put weight on the ankles and stand up. Here's what happens. You finally get freed up. It's what we want. See, here's the thing. We can't go from fed up to freed up automatically. You can't just all of a sudden start speaking out when you see something that hurts. What you have to do is you got to let fed up be this indicator. Okay, I need to fess up. I need to search my own heart and make sure my faith is what in what Jesus said. And then I get freed up. See, this guy had been too late for 38 years and now he meets his savior and he finds freedom. Too often we get fed up and then we do something that we regret we mess up but as followers of Jesus we have to look internally here's the thing once we do we can actually speak into injustice once we do we can get to a place where we fight against discrimination and we are a voice for the voiceless we can fight poverty we can fight systemic issues together as not only Riverbend Church but joining hands with others who are doing good in our world in Jesus name we get to do that but here's the thing it all begins with this next step a fess up do you know what the next step that changes everything is for us as followers of Jesus is this confession the next step that changes everything in our lives is confession and so this morning I want to take just a moment and talk to you who are watching 
maybe in your living room or in your car, in your bedroom, wherever you're tuning in from right now. The next step to freedom is confession. This is the next step that changes everything. It's confession. Like when you get fed up, I know sometimes that, that our next step, it feels like we need to lash out and say something or do something immediately. It's here that we have to trust that God is in control, like he's got this. And he first wants to do a work in us so that he can do a work through us. But it begins with us dealing with our pride and just going, God, I, I, I want to give you room to look around in my heart. I want to invite you in. And, and here's what happens when we get fed up. Let it be an indicator that it's time to to confess, to look inward. See, here's a verse. I'm going to read this to you. Jesus' uh, best friend, John, he wrote this down. Here's what he said. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. So if you find yourself fed up in your life before you blame someone else, and I'm not saying you're not a victim, maybe you are, but, but here's the thing. Before you lash out, before you live in shame because of someone else uh, has victimized you, stop. And let God search your heart first. Deal with you. Just go, Jesus, deal with me. If you confess, John said, if you get to the point where you put your pride aside and go, God, I have issues. God, here it is. And just say it out loud to him. And just tell him, here's what he's saying. Whenever you're willing to do that, that you have a God who is faithful and who is just. And because of the sacrifice he made for you on the cross, he will forgive you. And not only that, he'll cleanse you. That means that mentally, spiritually, he'll give you new mercy to start over again. And if you have to do that every day, no excuses, own it. Listen, come to the light of Jesus. He already knows you anyway. And so it's confession. But did you know that confession is not just to God? Maybe you heard it's just you and God and nobody else. Well, that's true, except he put us in the church. See, fess up is not only meant to be between you and God. It's also meant to be between you and God. And a trusted friend as well, like another trusted believer. Here's what, here's what James said, the half-brother of Jesus. He said, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. See, many of us have confessed to God and you go, God, here's my issue. God, I own it. But the problem with that is... We've never actually told someone else our strugglings, invited someone to, to fight the battle with us. We, we fail to do that so many times. You know why? Because we've been burned before. We told somebody something and they burned us and we said, I will never trust again. Come on, God wants you to trust somebody. There are people that will love you. They're not perfect and you're not perfect. And God will put you together. And by his spirit, you'll be able to pour your heart out. And here's what it says. When you do that, they can pray for you. And there's healing that comes. You're not meant to do this by yourself. So yes, confess it to God. But in this time of isolation, I think it's more important than ever before that you go, God, I need to talk to somebody else. I need somebody to pray for me. I need somebody who's, who's further along in their faith journey than me, maybe, to come alongside me and pray for me. And so here's a couple of questions I want to I wanna leave with you today. The first question is this, right now at home where you are, are you willing to fess up to Jesus? So if you've never confessed your sin to him before, it, it takes a lot of laying down the pride and a lot of admitting that all my problems are not other people's fault alone that I, I take some fault in that that I have sinned and I have fallen and I have flaws and and God I need you and I just want to say that to you and so the question is will you fess up to him remember what what John said he said if you'll confess to him he will receive you he will not only receive you he will forgive you and he will cleanse you but here's the second question am I willing to fess up to another follower of Jesus that I trust and I get it. This is hard. It's hard to, to, to own the, the deep issues of your heart or the, the skeletons in the closet from your past. I get it. I understand that it's hard to do that, but, but I want to invite you to freedom. It's my heart as a pastor. No matter where you're watching from today, listen, God can set you free, but you're going to have to allow him to not only search your heart, but put you towards, push you towards another believer who can pray with you and for you. And if you let us know online right now that you need prayer, send me a message. I would love to pray for you. 
and connect with you. But if you have somebody in your life that's more, you know, maybe a little further along in their Jesus journey, or maybe they're right with you, but you just trust them. And you know they're going to give you godly counsel from the scripture. And you know that they're going to say, I don't want to see you go down the road to destruction. I want to see you healthy and I want to see you freed up. But when you're fed up, listen, the next step is the most important thing you'll ever decide. Will I lash out? Will I cover it up? Will I hide it? Or will I actually say, God, I just need to tell you I'm fed up with what's going on in my life right now. And confess to Jesus, he'll forgive you. And then look at somebody else in your life and go, I need to tell you that I'm struggling and I need prayer. I need somebody to fight this battle with me. And so we're, here's what I want to do at home today. I want to pray for you, but I want to invite you to pray right now. And as you pray, just tell God your struggles and then ask him to put somebody on your heart that you can reach out to. If you want to trust us, we would be honored to pray with you. But if there's somebody else in your life, reach out. Listen, right now in this moment, while you feel it, reach out to someone else. Shoot the text right now and just say, hey, can we talk? Can we spend some time on the phone, FaceTime? Can we grab a cup of coffee? Whatever way. But listen, confess your sins to one another. And what does it say? That you will find healing. Can I pray for you today? Will you pray with me? So Jesus, even now. Lord, I know that you are drawing hearts to you and there are people that have held on to stuff that has held them down for years, maybe even 38 years. But God, there are people that have been hurting for that long because of this shadow of shame from being victimized or from bad decisions that they made. And so God, I want to ask you right now to free them up, Lord, to give them the strength that they need, Lord, to be drawn into you, the strength they need to be honest and to lay aside pride and go, God, I am flawed. I have failures. I'm a sinner. And so I pray that that's your heart today. Listen, if you cry out to him, if today's the first time and you say, Jesus, I confess my sin to you and I turn to you. Listen, he receives you as his child and he will save you. But I also want to pray for you today that, that you'll have the courage to reach out to someone who loves you. So God, right now in this moment, I'm asking you in Jesus name. To give everyone watching the courage to reach out to a friend and say, I'm stuck in this addiction. I'm fed up with it. I'm stuck in failing relationships. I'm fed up with it, but I'm ready today to be free. And so not only will I confess to you, God, I'm going to confess to a trusted friend. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit courage to do that. So God, I pray that people on the other end of this video will get freed up as they watch today. Freed up as they open their hearts to a God who loves them, who knows them and loves them. So Jesus, that is our prayer today. Listen, you know that you are loved. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to close out today with a song of worship, just saying, Jesus, you can break every stronghold. Jesus, we will call upon your name. And so I ask you right now, wherever you are, come on, let's lift up a praise of worship together.